So, and we'll go over that more. In fact, if you don't want to start your nutrition journal and all that stuff and you want to wait, you could start it next week starting at lab and do it for seven days from that point, as long as it's done in two labs from now. Does that make sense, yes. Christina? Okay. So if you want to get a jump on it, you can. Also, we have optional. You could do full 10 days if you're bold mm -hmm. and you're ready. You want to just go all out. You could do full 10 days or you could do 70. And again, if you really have a problem and you don't want to do this for whatever personal reasons, you can work with a buddy, somebody else doing it, and help analyze theirs. Like work on somebody else using their data, kind of analyze for yourself. All right, so we were talking about protein. Protein structure designates function, what they're able to do. We talked about enzymes and substrates, allowing them to bind and cause a reaction. We also talked about antibodies that can bind to very specific proteins that are not from your body, for example, from the flu virus. If you notice this, this shape of these proteins fits perfectly like lock and key to help recognize foreign invaders and pathogens in the body. This is the basis of our immune system. So if I mess up this protein, your made antibodies in your body, and destroy their, their structure, what will it do? Will it be able to recognize that once recognizable flu virus protein? If I change the structure of the antibody itself, no, it won't. It will not. It'll totally cripple or take away its ability, its functional ability to bind and help target and destroy um, antigens or foreign invaders in the body. So I'll go to the All right, so basically this is just a big way of saying that structure dictates function. And that goes for anything in your bodies. So everything in your body, your organs, your tissues, all of that. Boxes and extra cords in <laughs> That's what I feel like sometimes. Okay, so we get okay. So just like your body, cells, organs, structures, whatever the structure is, that is what gives that structure, that that organ, the ability to do whatever its function it needs to do. The same it comes down to the levels of protein. So if we mess up protein structure, we mess up protein function, and all the major metabolic things of your body, so eating, absorbing nutrients, metabolizing those, generating ATP from those, all of those are based on proteins. Enzymes and proteins doing their work, okay? So they need to have a specific structure. We have different levels of protein organization. Some of this gets a little complicated, so I'll make it real simple. I'll tell you the things that I expect you to know. The basic organization of proteins comes in sort of four different levels. That means it goes from simple to more complex. So we have level one, which we call sort of the primary structure of a protein. And that is just a simple amino acid sequence. So starting from the end, the end or the amino terminal end, going all the way down because they have a polarity, to the carboxyl end down here. These are all individual amino acids bonded together. Okay, so this is a big fat polymer. But notice, this is just that, the amino acid sequence. That's all primary structure is. It's like a limpy noodle. It's just like a noodle. That's the way the amino acids are strung together. Their structure, their sequence, is what we call in biology the primary structure. So you say the primary structure of this protein is composed of a serine, a lysine, an alanine, a tryptophan, like the names of the amino acids. That's it, just their sequence. So it's not even fancy. There's a polarity again, like I said. It's coded for by your genes. So your genes, your DNA, actually has bases, nitrogenous bases, that pair up with each other, and that is the code or the lettering that codes for specific amino acids. Now we'll look at that in just a few minutes. So your DNA codes for particular amino acids. The blueprint for how your proteins are gonna be built, how they're gonna be made, okay? So we have secondary structure. You don't have to know how to draw these or even really identify and try to do this on your own. Just realize that secondary structure is a little more complex. It's more than just the sequence of the amino acids. It's actually dependent on interactions in the backbone of the amino acids. So hydrogen bonds, allowing those adjacent, adjacent amino acids in these chains to kind of connect up with each other. All the little polka dots here, the little dots represent hydrogen bonds. So in the backbone, they're able to make an O with an H hydrogen bond, an O with an H hydrogen bond, O with an H. So it actually allows the proteins, the peptides, to start taking on a structure that has a shape, has a three-dimensional shape. So I like to call these the alpha helix and like 
the elementary school fan that you used to make. You guys ever make the little fan or the accordion, right? I'd be in class board, just folding back and forth, fanning it and throwing it at people. No, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> okay, beta pleated sheet. I, d I did do that a couple times to my friends. I was, I was a little rambunctious. Beta pleated sheet, alpha helix. These are the two different types of secondary protein structure that amino acids will make when they're all formed together. Okay, so it starts to give protein, uh, the protein primary structure, some shape. Okay, so we've got the little accordion and we've got the helix. So we've got alpha helices and beta pleated sheets. This is just the secondary structure of protein, but they get more complicated. They've got those structures, but then those structures coil up and make bonds and connections and make covalent and hydrogen and ionic bonds with other amino acids that are further away. And so then it makes more of a complex uh, structure, protein structure, that ends up like this, like real globular. A lot of alpha helices, some beta pleated sheets, alpha helices, sheets, and they all coil in and they kind of talk to and associate with each other, if you will. It gives it their final dimensional shape. That's what we call tertiary structure. You know, primary is like one, secondary is two, tertiary is three, Okay, so this is like the three-dimensional shape. Notice there's lots of connections. This is a covalent bond right here between these two distant amino acids. This is the chain or the primary structure. These two are far apart, but now they actually are near each other, so they make the covalent bond. This is called a disulfide bridge. Okay? Disulfide bridge here, an example, this is if you have curly hair, okay? So if you have curly hair, your actual proteins in your hair actually make disulfide bridges with each other more regularly, that helps to make that curl have a coil or a wave. Because there's protein and cells that make up your hair. If you have straight hair, you don't have a lot of disulfide bridges. So basically, this is just giving the protein its overall um, big three-dimensional structure. So there's interactions and bonds between side chains and the R groups. The R group groups are those individual R groups that each amino acid has. If you were taking bio one, you'd have to learn all 20 amino acids, what they look like, what their R groups were, and what their names were, and their acronyms. It's just like one of the lectures. So you don't have to do that. I, if you recognize some amino acid names, that's fine, that's great. We're gonna spend a little more time on some of the essential ones. But I just want you to know how they fit together, and then how they become primary, secondary, tertiary, and, as we'll see, um, quaternary structure. So you have hydrophobic interactions that sequester some of those hydrophobic side chains. So remember, some of these are all carbon and, and hydrogen. All carbon and hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. They're like fat, right? Hydrocarbon, fat. There's no charge, there's no oxygen, there's no anything. Over here, there's some charge. There's some OHs and, a and Os. You get some nice hydrogen bonds. And then here you have associations of hydrophobic things that don't like water. So they're gonna curl into the inner part of the protein. They're like, we don't like water, we're more like a fat, so we're gonna associate with each other, curl up, and they help to make the actual overall protein structure. Away from water, towards water. So there's a lot of weak and also strong interactions. Ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, covalent bonds that make up tertiary structure. So structure of hair, structure of things like um, all the major proteins in your body, things like collagen and hemoglobin, which we're gonna look at, Collagen is here, hemoglobin is here. This is an even more complex three-dimensional structure. So instead of just tertiary, a lot of proteins in your body that are really important are actually quaternary structure, four, okay? That means this is the fourth level. This means these are individual proteins, okay? So like collagen is an example. It's twisted individual amino acid, complex shape that makes these big cords, okay? Then these cords associate with each other. So they're actually from different genes or different proteins that are made, and then they get assembled together and glued together through these interactions or covalent bonds. So this by itself would be a tertiary protein. But because collagen is so twisted and complex and big, this macromolecule, it's actually a quaternary structure. Same with hemoglobin. One of these, there's alpha chains and there's beta chains. We've talked about hemoglobin already a couple times. What does hemoglobin do? carries oxygen. Remember you did the pulse oximeter in lab? That's actually measuring what percentage of your hemoglobin molecules are bound in carrying oxygen. What's a healthy number of percent saturi uh, blood saturation of oxygen? 98 is good? 90? Yep. 
97, high 90s is good. 96 to 99 is typically where most people are. 98, 99, perfect, beautiful. This is, that's representing how many of these little heme groups in each of these subunits are bound with oxygen. All of these hemoglobin molecules are packed, about a million per red blood cell, carrying oxygen. So when we did the pulse ox, that's exactly what we're measuring, just using a little light, because your, uh, your skin is thin, and we can look at the absorbance and see how many are saturated. But this has two beta chains, these are separate proteins, and it has two alpha chains that are separate proteins or separate subunits. All of these get covalently bonded together, and so it makes a quaternary structure. Not because there's four, just because it's a higher level of organization. You see that? Because these came from individual genes. They were made, created, folded up, and then they complexed together. So it represents one, two, three, four different proteins coming together. So some things in your body that have really critical importance are actually quaternary structure. They're super complicated in the way that they arrange, and they, they make that final form. So they're multiple subunits, and they're separate polypeptides that are bonded together. Polypeptide is just any, any protein that's three amino acids or longer. That's it. So we call them polypeptide because there's multiple peptide bonds, right? So only some proteins in your body, some that are very important. Do you guys know where you find collagen? Where's collagen found in the body? Skin. Skin, yes. And it starts to break down over time and not get replaced and replenished as quickly as you get older. And that's what partially contributes to aging and wrinkling and losing the fullness of skin. Um, less of this, it starts to erode and not get replenished as quickly. Um, also in your bones, believe it or not, your bones are made up of massive amounts of collagen. You have the salts, we talked about calcium phosphate salts, the mineral hard part of your bone, and then you have the more pliable, resilient part of the bone. Collagen fibers that are running in all different directions to help give uh, your bones some uh, resistance to compressive forces and resilience of the bone. All right, so collagen, insulin is another example, hemoglobin, and a lot of different enzymes have this quaternary structure, this more advanced level of organization. All right, so I asked you this already, you know this. What is hemoglobin, where is it, and what does it do? You should know that, because that's pretty important, it comes up a lot. So pro protein conformation or protein structure, how it's conformed or what is its overall structure, it depends on what solution or what solvent it's in, and the interactions depend on that water solvent. So as I showed the protein, when they have their primary structure, they end up folding. When they're made, they end up folding and taking on the secondary structure of the beta pleated sheet or the helix, and then finally taking in their tertiary or quaternary structure. But that depends on water surrounding them, right? Water is the polar solvent that's all around. It. So that helps them to take on their overall conformation. Also what affects protein conformation or structure, it's another word to say structure, is the temperature, okay? So temperature can actually, what can temperature do to proteins that you already know about? Because you boil an egg or cook an egg, you already do this, you already know. What can temperature do to proteins? Can it change them? Yes, it can change them. It can actually denature them. That's what we call denaturation or denaturing a protein. If I heat it up really, really hot, I break all of those bonds, those hydrogen bonds, the covalent, the ionic, and the weak interactions that help to keep those globular tertiary structures. If I put on a lot of heat energy, I will sever all those bonds, and I will take it back to primary structure. If I am in primary structure, can I do my job, my function that I'm supposed to do? Nope, because I lost my structure, I lost my function. So temperature is like a sticky, it's like a slippery slope. Because you increase temperature a little bit, it makes enzymes and proteins in your body and reactions in your body happen faster, right? This is why when you get a fever, because you get an infection or something, you have a fever, you get a little bit, your, your brain, your hypothalamus sets that little set point, raises it up, your body burns and makes it speed up and go a little bit hotter, so you're warmer. All those reactions can happen more quickly, okay? Your white blood cells can fight better. Your enzymes can act and break things down and do their reactions more quickly. Your metabolic rates can speed up and go more quickly. So that is actually a healthy, normal response. Speed up, get it done, get the work done. Now this is the problem. You get a fever that's too high. Too high in humans for most people, 104, 105, 106 degrees, that's too high. The brain, the neurons start to get cooked at that point. The, the actual proteins get denatured 
And if they get denatured, a lot of times this is irreversible. The protein can't fold back up to its normal structure and resume its life doing all of its normal stuff. So high temperatures will actually denature enzymes, critical proteins, and even things like neurons in the brain. They will start to not be able to produce their neurotransmitters and fire an action potential. And all those enzymes, proteins, and cells will start to shut down. So it can cause death. You can, you've heard of things like even meningitis and high, high fevers, blindness, deafness, all kinds of other things resulting from that. So we've got a little tricky. We've got to have nice warm temperature. And you speed that temperature up or you increase that temperature a little bit, it speeds up reaction rates. That's good. But if you keep it too high for too long or it goes above that threshold, you start denaturing proteins and destroying cells and tissues in the body. And that's real, real bad. Especially when you, when you have a baby. I had a, my first baby, my first daughter, Arlinda, she was born, and at two weeks old, she got a really high fever. And it was like 103, and they started getting really nervous. They said, okay, we've got to admit you to the hospital. She was tiny, teeny. She had a crusty eye. She would wake up, and her eye was kind of closed and crusty, and I thought, oh, no, she has pink eye. How did she get pink eye? Probably from the hospital or the pediatrician visit. That's usually where those things happen. And she, she couldn't open her eye, and I told her, I'm pretty sure it's pink eye. It's a streptococcal infection in the eye. If we could just get the ointment, the antibiotic, I think we'll be good. She said, no. So she's two weeks old. She's got this high of a fever. We risk damage, long-term damage, and even death. And I knew that, but I was like, okay, fine. So what, what do you recommend? She said, just go pack all your stuff, check it in the hospital, come. We're going to have to do a spinal. We have to rule out meningitis. So she had to do a spinal tap at two weeks old. Tiny little baby. And I said, oh, I'm going to be in the room. So I'm not going to lose it. I, I'm going to be in the room. I'll help. I'll hold. I'll do whatever. And she said, okay, if a lot of parents don't want to do it. I said, that's fine. I'm not a lot of parents. <laughs> so... I'm gonna, and I was a new mom. I was 22 years old. I had her very young. So I was like, no, I'm, I'm staying in the room, okay? So I held, they, they said we gotta have her lay like a peanut sort of fetal position sideways. You have to extend the back so that they can get the needle in between the vertebrae and get it right into the cerebral spinal space because they have to get fluid to get a sample. The whole time I'm thinking, this high fever is linked to the pink eye. It's not meningitis. But if it is, I don't want to, I don't want to be like, you know, would have, could have, should have. This is a serious, you kind of have to do it anyways, just in case. And so we did it. She got it, took her like two or three times. She couldn't get enough fluid. She was tiny. She was screaming. I'm holding her and I could feel her body like arching and hyperflexing and I'm just holding her. She finally got enough fluid. We're in the hospital for like three, four days. They did the swab of the eye. The meningitis thing came back negative. The eye swab came back, struck the caucus, pink eye. That was a very fun experience for a new mom, like two week old baby. But Fevers can be really dangerous, so you have to take them seriously, especially in uh, elderly and like little tiny infants like that, because it really they, they are very sensitive. Their new cells and tissues and structures are very sensitive to temperature-dependent uh, denaturation. So the heat actually weakens or destroys the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and the quaternary structure of proteins. This is why fevers and high temperature are bad. That's why. Plain and simple. It has to do with the the structure of proteins in the body and how those proteins can function and do what they're supposed to do. Protein denaturation with high temps. Okay, so an example, which is good, and we do, if you eat eggs, I eat eggs, I like them. Boil an egg, it causes the protein albumin to agglutinate. It denatures it and it becomes a gelatinous kind of meshwork. That's the hardened egg white of a boiled egg. You denatured it. Took on a new conformation, now it's gelatinous. Can you undo that when you boil an egg? Can you undo it? You can. In, in science, we call that irreversible. That reaction is irreversible. I can go this way, but I can't go that way. Okay. So that's why with some of these proteins and tissues in your body, it's irreversible. That damage can be irreversible. You can't go back the other way. Changes in protein shape, just a little clinical aspect, are linked with very different, various different diseases, including Alzheimer's, um, Parkinson's, sickle cell anemia, they're all associated with changes in protein structure or shape, and that causes the etiology of the disease or the problem with the disease. Sickle cell is an example, sickle cell anemia. This is where the hemoglobin molecule that we just looked at a few slides ago, it's got, that, it's got the beta, beta, alpha, alpha. So normally, you've got, here's the secondary structure, and then the quaternary structure is all four of those subunits together. There's two alphas and two betas. This happens to be sickle, so the beta subunit is actually different. Instead of making the nice normal little uh, globular shape, it makes a jutting out shape, okay? So we change the secondary structure of the beta subunit. 
And so when it forms together to make the final quaternary structure, it's different than it used to be. And these actually polymerize together. They make little Jenga puzzle pieces and they start to stick together. That's not supposed to happen. Hemoglobin molecules are supposed to be individual quaternary structure, just molecules floating around in the hemoglobin, right? And they carry oxygen and then they release the oxygen. And then they pick up this carbon dioxide and they bring this carbon dioxide back and you exhale out the lungs. And they carry and they bring more oxygen to the rest of the body. You are not supposed to have hemoglobin that polymerizes and makes big chains inside of the red blood cells. So those big chains actually make giant big polymers that actually sickle out the red blood cells. So instead of a red blood cell like this, a ball spike concave, kind of looks like a nice sphere that you push in a little bit like a donut. Instead of looking like that, it ends up going like that and kind of sickling, and getting long and thin. Okay. So for capillaries, they're already very small. The average human capillary is about 8 to 10 microns in diameter. The average red blood cell, normal red blood cell, is about 7 microns. 7 microns is just enough to get blood cells through those little tiniest of your millions of capillaries of your body. So if you sickle out some of those red blood cells, not even all of them, just some of them, where they get the shape that's skinny and sickled, they try to go through the capillaries and what happens? They get stuck. They get wedged. They're not getting through. You just made a jam pile up, traffic jam in one of those vessels. Now you cannot get all the little oxygen transporters and nutrient transport to those actual tissues and organs. So the clinical effects of altering just one protein, and actually I'm going to make it even more dramatic and tell you this comes down to one amino acid. This is one amino acid substitution, mutation, that is changed from a valine. One amino acid changes the beta subunit, which changes the quaternary structure, which changes the cell structure. So now the red blood cells cannot behave or carry out the function the way they're supposed to. So cascading effects of changing a single amino acid, one single mutation. And it, it, it's genetically inherited, so it can be passed down. So um, some people have higher rates of this in their family, in their background, because it is genetic. It has this genetic predisposition. So the quaternary shape distorts the, the, of the hemoglobin distorts the red blood cells. So one copy of the sickle cell anemia gene actually protects against something. Okay? So it's interesting because and actually sickle cell anemia has an interesting history and kind of some discrimination and racism and all kinds of isms with the history because certain populations of individuals, especially coming from like Africa and South America, these levels of sickle cell anemia are higher. Those rates are higher. They are a little bit higher and they're passed down in families, like they're genetically inherited, okay? So those, those rates of these specific, this specific genetic sickle cell anemia is, is, has higher prevalence. So along with that, if you are a carrier of sickle cell anemia, so you just have one gene, instead of having both, if you just have one of those genes, you don't have the expression of the change in the protein, you don't have the disease, you don't have any of the symptoms, you're just a carrier. Okay, so that doesn't affect you at all. That's perfectly fine. Matter of fact, research has revealed in the last many decades that having a copy of the SCA gene, so one side coming even from mom or dad has the SCA gene with the change, actually protects you against malaria, the blood-infecting parasite that's in certain places around the world in certain countries, more prevalent than others. So if you have the carrier, if you are the carrier of it, you will not get malaria. Malaria actually causes more death than many other things combined around the world. So genetically, if you're a carrier, it actually has protective beneficial effects. You will not get malaria. Now, if you have two copies of the sickle cell gene, then you will have sickle cell anemia. And then you have to go through medical treatments. Many times they do blood transfusions to try to get normal red blood cells to the patients that have it. When they get flare-ups, they get symptoms, like I've had friends that have sickle cell, they get flare-ups, they get painful, very, very achy, painful fatigue, tiredness, nauseous. They can't, it's like they can't breathe. So, so certain areas of the body, wherever there's impaction and the red blood cells cannot make it through, they'll have pain and aches in those locations. And they call them flare-ups because they're not all the time. For most people, they take their medications, they get it away, they go through their blood transfusions, and they can keep it under control. But oftentimes still the longevity or the lifespan is reduced in individuals with sickle cell anemia. So 
there's all there's a whole history of this and going back for a long time, but now we know a lot more about it and the protective effects of actually having the one copy of the gene. Did you have a question, Alex? Yeah, what is it affect? Same thing. Same thing. Well, I, the idea really for a lot of people that study this very well, the scientists that are studying this, is those individuals are exposed to some of these parasites way more than other populations in the world. They have malaria. So think about it. If you have, if I'm a carrier and I'm in deep South America or I'm in Africa and there's a lot of malaria, there's a lot of parasitic infections that are carried by bug born type things like mosquitoes. They just carry it in the blood, they carry it from one person to another. If I'm there, if I'm a carrier, this protects me against malaria. Am I going to survive? Okay, I'm going to survive. Might I have kids? Yep. Might my kids be carriers and carry the same gene as well? So they will survive. So this gene will actually be perpetuated in the human population in those geographical areas because it has a protective survival effect. Do you, does that make sense? But if you've got two copies, then you have problems with your red blood cells because of the hemoglobin. So again, it's another one of those double-edged sword kind of things. But it is based on geography and region. It's not really based on ancestry or ethnicity. It's geography in the world and what your environment is exposing you to. And which genes get survival of the fittest and continue, and which ones get cropped out and they're done and they don't survive in the following subsequent gene pools and offspring. Does that make sense? Yes? I see some confused looks. Like, does this make sense? Yes. How do you know if you're a carrier? You get tested very easily. Genetic test. Yeah. Genetic test, see if you're a carrier. And some people are. And th this is the thing. If you're a carrier, and they tried to come up with, we've had a whole bunch of discrimination and prejudice and leaders and politicians, they started trying to say they wanted to test for people that were carriers. And sort of test and have that be a, like on the record, on your medical record, whether you're a carrier or not. That was not done, and that was done away with, but people were proposing to do that. So if you are a carrier, and somebody else is a carrier, and you have children together, the chances of your child having sickle cell is very high, because you're both carriers, right? And you both pass on that carrier gene. So in those cases, typically, it's about a 50% chance of the offspring having sickle cell and having dosa. Any other questions? OK, so this is linking. The reason I do this, this kind of complicated example is because this really hits home the importance of protein structure. Protein structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, determines the function of that protein. And if you mess it up, sometimes even one amino acid, it'll mess up the whole function. And it can actually lead to, lead to disease and death and other problems, okay? Other examples are like Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's disease, we have neurons. Normal neuron would not be gunked up with neurofibrillary tangles in it. Proteins that are misfolded and have the wrong shape. Or these little stars, these amyloid plaques. So Alzheimer's is characteristic. Brains of Alzheimer's patients characteristically have amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. They call them plaques and tangles, or senile plaques, they call them, and neurofibrillary tangles. My grandma had Alzheimer's. So I got to see this firsthand, just the, some, what someone goes through when they get Alzheimer's and when it progressively gets worse and worse and worse. And they're losing more and more of their memory. The interesting thing is they keep the longer term memory. It's the shorter term memories that go. They, they can't build the new memories as well, and they start to lose all the shorter stuff. They also start to, when it gets really severe, they forget names and people. So it got to the point where my grandma didn't know my name anymore. She didn't know. She knew she knew me, or she felt like she needed to know me, and she'd say hi. But at one point, she thought I was my dad's wife. I'm like, no, Grandma, I'm not dad's wife. <laughs> I'm dad's daughter. I'm your son's daughter. So your granddaughter. She's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it just, she lost all of that part of the memory. So misfolded proteins we know is connected with neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, a lot of those. Misfolded, um, inappropriate structure proteins, outside and inside of the cells. This is a typical neuron in the brain. And so these are things accumulating, these star-like structures accumulating outside and sort of gunking stuff up. We still don't know, though. There's a lot to figure out. Chicken or the egg? We don't know if these come first and then the disease onset happens, or if the disease starts to happen, and as a side effect of trying to fix the problems, proteins get misfolded and unfolded and take on the shit. We really don't know, because we, we can't really study the brain, the living human brain inside the brain, while well, the person's alive, right? So they have to donate their organs and their parts for research, and then when they die, they do sections and biopsies of the brain, and they find these in all the brains. 
but it's very hard to figure out which came first. So that's where they're starting to do stem cell studies, where they take human stem cells, neuronal stem cells, from people that develop Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, and they study them in the dish. Because we can easily study stuff in the dish. It's way, it's easier, more feasible, it's more ethical. <gasps> Ooh, that's why my mom's old right. phone. That's all right. Okay, so we're gonna take a second. With that, we're just gonna take a second and do a little application. Uh, question, just think about this for a second. You don't have to draw it real fancy. I want little doodles, okay? Little doodles. I don't want you to draw each individual thing and be on the ride. What's the primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure of a protein? And it's almost just, just like chicken scratch on a page. Primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. I'll leave it up. Does that make sense? You just you can write it in a word or a sentence, and you can just draw it real simple. Right? Just yeah, I want you to just think about like what these are that we just went over. Are you drawing then? Yeah, you're going to just turn these in. Yeah, okay. so whatever you sketch and doodle, you'll turn oh, them in. And you can take, oh. if you want to take time, you guys can do this at home. You can bring it on Monday. That's okay. fine. I don't want to make you rush and feel like, oh my gosh, I want to do better. Just, I just want you